And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to the Dice Tower. Today we're taking a look at Hallertau from Uwe Rosenberg. Now, Uwe Rosenberg, spoiler alert, has made some of my favorite games. Lahav, Caverna, and um, Feast for Odin are in my favorite games of all time. But I do like his games. I like Oren Labora. I don't like every game he's done, but his big box games are very fun and interesting and entertaining for me. So I was very excited about Hallertau. I found that, you know, I either love one of his games or at least, at the very least, I usually find it incredibly fascinating. And this one is no exception. Yes, it's about farming again. But hey, let's see what's different. Let's see what's interesting. Here we go. game players are trying to score piles of points and a lot of that is done on the players board now this is all the stuff including uh, this thing down here and each player is also going to have a board here to keep track of the rounds this is one player setup so let me explain a couple things here and I'm not going to go over every rule of the game but I want to give you some idea of what's going on you're going to have different resources players will start with some resources but you can get more resources as the game goes by if, let's say, for example, I get some more flax, so I, I start here with just one flax, let's say I get three more, I would simply move this up to four. If I got three more, I'd move this to five, take another token, and move it to two. That's just a way that I keep track of how much I have, and if I spend it or use it, it will come down. At various points in the game, you will plant some of these resources, so let's say I plant wheat here in this field, this field's at level three, and if I harvest it, it's going to come over here straight like that to show I got three wheat. Fields will be going up or down in the same column. If each round, a field that doesn't have anything in it is going to go up one. In fact, one of them will go up two, and each one that does produce will go down one, although they can never go below two, and they can never go above five. Now that's one aspect, keeping track of all your resources. You also have gems here, which are really powerful, and you just keep track of them with this ring. Up here is the main focus of the game. The game's going to take place over six rounds, and you have some cards here. Each round, you're going to take a card off, and you're going to be adding that card to your hand at the end of a round. You're going to be spending resources to move these small buildings over. Once you get them all over, your large building is going to go over. And the reason you want that large building to move is because as you get to the very end, it's worth victory points. And if these small buildings move past these tokens over here, they're going to be worth some victory points, possibly in addition to the number on the house. But if you get them all moved over, you can get the highest amount total. To move these over, at the end of each round, players are going to be spending resources. So to move the cooling house over, for example, I need meat or milk. Those two resources work. The bakehouse, I need wheat or uh, the flax, but I can only use one flax or the grain here or the hops. Um, so here I can use... Sorry, here's hops, and I forget the names of the different resources, but I need more of one of them. I need more of these than the other. Now, to move a building over is essentially equivalent to the round. So in round one, it's only going to cost one good to move each of these over. In round two, it's going to cost two goods. In round three, it costs three goods or two goods of different types. All the way up to round six, where it's six goods, but five goods for two different types, four goods with three different types. However, these rocks are also going to be stopping you, so even if I want to move it over one, I can't move it because that rock is in the way. So players, if they have tools, will essentially exhaust a tool. You don't lose your tools. Exhaust a tool, if they have them, to move a rock one space. So if I, you have one tool, I can move my building two times. But after that, I'm going to need three tools to move this rock, then this rock, to move it again. So earlier in the game, it's cheaper to move these buildings, but you also have fewer resources. The number here is going to be the number of actions that you're going to get. You're going to get a certain number of cubes for actions. 
This uh, here, the treasure chest, also, when you're moving a building over, instead of paying, for example, in round four, four goods, I can simply pay one jewel to move everything over. So that's what you're trying to do, and you're doing it through the main board. As I said, in each round of the game, players are going to get a certain number of these action cubes. And they're going to be taking turns in turn order, starting with the person who has the rooster. And you're going to place them on the board. The first time you take an action, you put one. If someone takes an action, including yourself again, you'll need to place two. And then you'll need to place three. And then that action can no longer be taken. At the beginning of each round, you'll take off the top row. And if you're playing with less than four players, not every row will be taken off. It will tell you which quadrants uh, the rows are taken off of so that the board remains tight no matter how many players are in the game. Most of these are pretty self-explanatory. They're going to give you, like for example, this gives you cloth equal to the round number. This gives you four cloth or lets you plant a new field at level four. Some of them are going to give you sheep. Some of them are going to give, let you, this one lets you turn a sheep into four meat and two uh, of the uh, hides. Over here, these are going to give you cards and also give you the starting player marker. Now, it's very critical in this game, there are a lot of cards. The cards for the bottom two decks are the same in every game, but the top two decks, there's multiple different types of decks that they can be. Not to mention, you'll get a farmer card into your hand every round off of your round board. These cards can be played on your turn as long as you can do whatever it says. Sometimes there shows an arrow, you need to pay it. So for example, if I pay three hides or four of these, I will get two fields at level three. Plus I get to draw a card down here at the bottom. So there's lots of one-time usings. If there's just a bar, you don't need to spend it. This just means I have a total of 12 tools and fields and I get a jewel. Uh, here, if one of the action space on the board is fully occupied, I get a sheep and a field at level two. So you can play these and these are basically going to give you benefits. We also have gate cards, which are very similar. They're gonna give you benefits. Usually you don't have to pay for them. So for example, this one, if I have one, three, four, or six tools, I can get zero, one, two, or three milk and draw a card. The, over here, these cards um, will, if you can fulfill them, so if I pay a ring and a tool, this card stays in play and for the rest of the game, during round three, I'm going to get a flax and I'm going to get yarn. It's also worth four points at the end of the game. So these cards are worth points, but also can give you permanent benefits in the third part of each round. And then finally, these cards themselves are just huge ways to get victory points. Do I have six hat cards in play? Six victory points. Can I spend 13 yarn or 16 milk? 10 victory points. So players are going to have to choose the right time to and pick the right pile of cards. And you can get these cards here and playing some cards gives you other cards. When you're placing these workers on the board, you can also decide not to place workers. You can discard as many of these as you want and take the equal number of tools, which as you see are used for some of the cards and also used to move your buildings over. This is pretty much how the game works. There's obviously a few more rules. We did a whole live playthrough of it on our channel, so you can watch and see how that works. But you're going to be going over six rounds, placing the workers. Um, there's a whole round overview here that tells you what to do each time. The main part of the game is both placing the workers and then using the resources to move these buildings over to move your big giant house over. Once the game is over, you'll reveal a few extra cards or things that give you extra points, and whoever has the most points is the winner of the game. Now, as you might have noticed, there's a lot of real estate. This is a single-player game, right? This is one person's setup. I played with four people, and it fills up the entire table. Even with two players, if you go watch our two-player game of it, it takes up a lot of space. I don't mind the components for the most part. I do kind of wish that this was just one board per player instead of having four boards and the rings and stuff. It's neat that this slides across here, um, but moving these stones, because the stones after each round, they reset to two spaces and four spaces ahead of each building. I found that to be a little fiddly. This is the weirdest thing of the game for me. I'm used to, you know, if you take four flax, you take 
four flex. However, in this game, you put it here at the number four, which occasionally you can forget. You know, if you have this here, you have seven. You know, and that can be, there's some neat aspects to it. Like if you're over here, hey, it moves over and becomes that. I like that part. But we found the constant adjustment of resources to be a little bit fiddly. And the game itself, you know, this is kind of a, oh, looks like a spreadsheet. The components themselves are very well done. I like all the different shapes and colors, and they're pretty easy to tell apart, even if I can never remember the difference between hops and, and flax and all that sort of thing. The rule book, as with all Uwe Rosenbook, Rosenberg books, explains the rules, I thought, fairly well, and then at the end explains every single card you can look up just in case. You don't need to. I found very rarely did I have to look up a specific card, but it exists, and I like that. And the round overview card's really nice because it shows you the text part of a round, or you can just use the other side where it shows the pictorial reference of what you do each round. There's a few other rules I didn't mention, like sheep age and can possibly die and are worth points at the end of the game and some other stuff, but hopefully that gives you a feel of how the game works. All right, there you have it, Howard Tao. There's a lot to say about the game. So I'm going to start off by saying I like it. I don't know if I love it. It's going to take a while and more plays to see. Like, for example, I don't think it's as good as Lahav and, and Caverna slash Agricola and Feast for Oda. Not for me. Not yet. But it, the game it feels actually most similar to me, too, I, I suppose, would be uh, the Fields of Arl which I like and enjoy, and this kind of feels in that category. But man, it's, a, it's, it's such an interesting game, and there's things I like and don't like. So one of the things I always laugh about in Uwe Rosenberg games is he likes to feed the people. Every round you feed your people, and even in my favorite games, Caverna, Lahav, and Feast for Odin, you feed your people in all three of them. So you don't do that here, but you kind of do, because at the end of every round, you need to move your buildings over as far as you, as you can. If you're not moving those buildings over, you're not going to get enough action points, and you're not going to score bonus points at the end of the game. So that concept is pretty interesting. It's a nice balancing mechanism, because as you get more and more resources, you spend more and more resources to move those buildings over. And trying to move them all the way over to the end can be tricky. I've seen it done. I've not done it myself, but I moved it pretty far, and I like that. I kind of play against my previous scores in the game. There's not a ton of interaction in this game, which is typical. Um, there's, you know, the worker placement, go somewhere before somebody else takes that spot. I mean, it's definitely there, and you definitely want to go first. But other than that, you're kind of working on your own board in front of you. And, you know, it's interesting. You're trying to figure out which resources to get. Do you want to farm resources? Do you want to go heavy into sheep? And because sheep produce milk. But you have to kind of get a spread of everything. So this is not like some games of his where you can concentrate on one thing. Here you pretty much need to get that spread of everything because every all the different buildings need specific resources. Although I guess you could skip a couple if you get a bunch of jewels and move them over. Now where this game is the same as others Worker placement, I've seen that before. Different decks of cards, interesting, but I've seen that before. Moving the buildings over is a unique idea, but for some reason doesn't feel that cool. It's kind of, it's okay. And I, like I said, the stones moving over, I found that part fiddly. It felt like those stones are simply there just to keep you from, on the first turn of the game, moving over too far. And I found them to, that's one mechanism which I, I, I understand it from a gameplay perspective, but I found it to be just more annoying than interesting. So that's my one thing about the gameplay I didn't enjoy. But what I really like about this game is the card play. It's so much fun. You draw the cards, you're constantly saying, ooh, this card does this, this card does this, I need to get five sheep and pull this off, I get the five sheep, play this card, and sometimes playing one card gives you the resources to play another card. That is super fun, and I really like that. But that does bring me to one small problem that you or other people may have with the game. Those cards can be lucky. You can draw a card and say, I already have this. Fantastic. Boom. Or you may draw a card. Like in my first game of this I played, I decided to just burn my fields down. I was getting rid of fields left and right because there's a spot on the board where you can get rid of a field to get a jewel and three cloth. So I was like, all right, you can do that. And another card said spend a field to do stuff. And I did that. And then I drew at least three cards that were like, if you have a bunch of fields, you get points. Oh, well, too late in the game for that. And that was just bad luck. 
You might argue, well, you tr try to be prepared for all possibilities, but you can't. And so that would be my one concern balance-wise. Sometimes if you're playing someone and you're both very close, the person who draws cards that match the strategy that they've chosen might do a little bit better. The game seems to scale fine. I've played it at all player counts except for one. So I've not played a solo version of this. Um, but it scales well. I tend to, I don't know, I think I might like the four player best just because you don't have those quadrant cards. But the quadrant cards are nice. And there's definitely, there's just a lot going on. The and when it's time to move the buildings over, everyone gets quiet and they're all working together and trying to figure out how you spend your resources and do this. And again, like I said, you can go watch our live play to see how the game works. But this one's a good one. I don't normally mention my numerical ratings in reviews. I'm mentioning this one that it's an 8 out of 10, where it's just shy of what I would consider to be a great game. But it's very, very good. And as time goes by, it might rise up. But it also might just stay where it's at. We'll have to wait and see. Rosenberg games tend to do that to me. I don't normally say they're amazing at the gate. They're just as more plays go by or comparison to other games. I'll tell you, this one didn't necessarily wow me. But I will say each game of it, I progressively liked a little more. And I'm not bored of the game yet either. So... Pretty cool ideas. I hope that this is one that I'm still playing in a while. It's a neat game. I'm glad Rosenberg's still making these big games. A little tired of the theme, and there's only so much farming I can take, but it's a lot of fun to talk about and play Howard Tau. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. Dice Tower Judgment approved. <laughs>